an unshakable commitment to Israel's security. That starts with ensuring Israel's qualitative military advantage. Excuse me, my sir, Indonesia! Indonesia! 
bir başkasına devlet Yaralı ne diye yaralı? Aşağıya yaralı. Şu ne oldu salon? Aşağıya. Aşağıya. Elhamdülillah. Allah Allah, Abi aşağı alalım ya. Alacak adama istiyor ağır vücut şimdi. Çek misin? Beyler, beyler. Şurayı açmamız lazım. Geldi, sete geldi. Hangisini alacaksınız? Gel, gel, gel. Tamam, abi. Tamam, abi. Tamam, abi. Tamam, abi. Tamam, abi. Tamam, tutun bu arkadaşlarım hemen. Tamam. Hemen, hemen, hemen. Hemen, aşağıya ağaç. Hemen, hemen. Herkes tutsun. Çekil yol ver, yol ver. Ya arkadaşlarım, sağlam tutun, hadi. Ya Allah, bismillah. Ya hadi. Buyur, buyur. Bismillah, tut. Alttan tut. Bismillah. Kaldır, kaldır. Ver, 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 ver. Böyle. Bırak, bırak, bırak. Burada bir yere koyar be şimdi hadi. Şimdiden al. Kes, kes. Muhammed ya gel. Şey diye. Doktor Muhammed zaman alın. Geri atıyorsunuz istinadı size zula yapmak lazım. Kimsenin eline vermemek lazım. Muhammed açtım açtım. Oksijen var mı? Yok. Kimse karşılık vermez. Aç aç. Şey kadar. I'd like to, uh, my name is Randolph Ermsen. I'm a St. Mark's parishioner, and I'd like to ask the Reverend David Messenbring to open with a prayer. Thank you, and thank you to uh, Randy for um, hosting us tonight. God be with you. Let us pray. Holy One, we give thanks to you for space and territory in which to gather. 
with the right to a freedom of speech. Open our hearts to hear the truth that your Christian scriptures promise can make us free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Thank you for gathering us in safety when so many don't have it. May we use what we hear Not for the, so much for the sake of our own solving conscience, but let it empower us to act on behalf of all your children, who you love even if we don't. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dan. I'm honored to be the uh, MC tonight for this evening, and excellent uh, uh, speakers on the crisis in Gaza, the failure of U.S. policy. The sponsors uh, include the Mideast Focus Ministry of St. Mark's Cathedral, Sibyl Puget Sound, the Jewish Voice for Peace, Palestinian Concerns Task Force, Episcopal Bishops Committee on Israel, Israel, Palestine, Voices of Palestine, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, American Friends Service Committee, Pacific Northwest, American Jews for Just Peace, United Nations Association of Greater Seattle chapter, and other other sponsors I haven't mentioned. Seattle Middle East Awareness Campaign. Uh, the sponsors uh, tonight would like to bet, uh, dedicate this evening to Bill Christensen. Uh, he was the lead speaker at the February conference on what does justice require of us. After a long career with the CIA, dealing with the Middle East issues, he devoted the last 10 years of his life to issues of U.S. military and economic hegemony. Those who have been working the Middle East issues for a long time believe that they have lost a true patriarch. I'd like to go over the uh, schedule for tonight. Our first speaker is Steve Niva. Uh, Steve is a professor of international politics and Middle East studies at Evergreen State College. He's a contributor to many journals and newspaper articles. He's also the author of a forthcoming book on uh, Suicide bombers. <laughs> and uh, he, um, I, I look forward to reading that. Uh, he, he, he'll discuss the background of U.S.-Israel uh, relations, the current developments within the Obama administration, and ideas for practical action. Uh, Richard Silverstein is the author, uh, the next speaker is the author of a notable blog called Tycom Olam, and, and I, you, Tikkun Olam, and, and make the world a better place, uh, essays on politics, culture, and ideas about Israel, Arab um, peace, and world music. Uh, Richard is a self-described progressive Zionist. He is uh, also um, uh, he's a proponent of a two-state solution with uh, Israel withdrawing to the, the uh, pre-1967 borders. He's also the co-founder founder with um, Gene Ter uh, Tenney of the Bay Area Jewish Music Festival. The next speaker, David Shermerhorn, uh, he's a retired film producer and a seasoned supporter of Palestinian rights. He was aboard one of the three 
uh, boats of the Freedom Flotilla that was intercepted by Israeli Defense Force. <laughs> well, uh, as, as you know, while they were attempting to break the Israeli siege and reach Gaza. Our, our next speaker will be Hazim Hazam Shafi. Hazam Shafi. Hazam was born in Gaza and graduated from a Quaker high school in Ramallah, Palestine. His family lived for many years in Gaza, and he still has many close relatives there. Uh, his uncle, uh, Haida Abdul Shali, was a former uh, uh, Palestinian uh, leader and a very respected negotiator. Uh, he will touch on the human toll of occupation and the uh, blockade. And Hassam currently lives in Seattle. And I mentioned that Richard will talk about, um, with his blog, he'll talk about the rising political repression in Israel. And Steve, are you, you take over? And I was, one thing I forgot, we will, after Hassam has spoken, we'll have a, um, a question and answer period, so save your questions for then. Uh, they'll just, we want to be limit them to one minute and be very respectful. Uh, and uh, so we can look forward to that at nine o'clock. Well, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for coming here. This is a fantastic crowd that's here tonight. And I think with all the events in the news, there's a, uh, sincere motivation here to, to have open and engaged dialogue and discussion, understanding about current events and what's behind them. With that in mind, I want to focus my remarks on the current strategic context, particularly, I'll try and speak in the microphone, sure, particularly uh, as it relates to what explains current U U.S. foreign policy towards the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the current developments. So taking a wider view beyond the headlines, beyond the immediate 24-second, 24-7 cycle, Twitter, blogs, etc., wider picture, I think we have two developments that are sort of, that, that are of uh, uh, major strategic importance that we need to be thinking about. The first is, I think that Israel's ongoing effort to legitimate and basically hide and disappear in a sense its ongoing occupation and colonization of Palestinian land, what I would call the Greater Israel Project. There are many different kinds of Israel, but the one in power is the Greater Israel Project that seeks to control over 3.5 million Palestinians' lives, their land, their water, disappearing them behind walls and fences, and taking the land to build and expand Israeli settlements. This project, I think, is confronting its most serious challenge since the first intifada in 1987. In 1987, Palestinians rose up to challenge this occupation and the theft of their land, and in doing so, revealed Israel's occupation to the world and its grossly disproportionate use of power, and that Israel was not the besieged party whose existence was endangered, but that, that actually Israel was the one in, uh, besieging another people and endangering their existence as a national people. The 1987 Intifada was a huge watershed in events in the Middle East. No longer could Israel pretend that, there was not, that it was not in occupation of another people in their land. It reversed the David and Goliath image that had been so carefully cultivated by Israel up to that point, certainly in the United States. Um, doesn't take me to say that. Israeli analysts, thinkers, strategists, they were all saying this as well, that this was probably the, the most serious blow since 1982 invasion of Lebanon for them. I believe that similarly today, Israel is losing its ability to control the narrative, to control the image of the conflict, which it had regained, partly due to severe Palestinian failures, partly due to uh, unconscionable acts like suicide bombings in Israeli uh, homes and in uh, uh, civic areas, um, and partly due to propaganda of various Israeli governments who wanted to disappear the fact that it was an occupying power. But nevertheless, the narrative had changed. But I think we're seeing this shift again. 
And I think fewer people today, especially in the past several years, are buying the old story that Israel's the victim, that's only concerned about its own security. Um, and I think increasingly many people are seeing Israel once again as the aggressor in occupation of another people, and that it's using brutal and disproportionate violence, not in self-defense, but rather to maintain its power, to maintain the status quo, and to maintain its occupation. I think what's interesting about it this time, as opposed to 1987, is that this time, Israel's, I think, increasing loss of control of the narrative and its increasing challenges to its legitimacy and its image is largely self-inflicted. That's what's interesting about what's happening right now. To take the most obvious and notable examples, the Lebanon War of 2006, when Israel uh, engaged in a grossly disproportionate attack on the Lebanese population and civilian infrastructure um, with the idea that attacking a civilian population, pressuring it lower in standard of living, would actually increase pressure on Hezbollah, which was its primary target, and it was an utter failure. Then we had the Gaza War a couple years ago, the end of 2008, 2009. I think this was a pivotal moment in what we're seeing today unfolding, where, once again, Israel used grossly disproportionate force and violence on an impoverished and almost completely encircled and enclosed patch of land. Again, with the goal of punishing the population, putting pressure on the population through lowering its standard of living, causing severe civilian hardships, with the idea that it would um, oppose the Ham Hamas government that had merged in power as a response. And now, most recently, and of course, that was another failure. In fact, Hamas's support actually increased because people no longer blamed Hamas for their ills, they blamed Israel. Once again, in our most recent event, we have the flotilla attack, which we'll hear more about, I'm sure, now. But you're seeing a similar pattern here. Again, absolutely unnecessary, uh, botched use of force. In this case, in international waters, which by anyone's definition is either hijacking or piracy, there's no two ways about it. Whether you agree with it or not, it's in international waters, it's not, it's not legitimate, regardless of what happened on the boats, which we'll have more discussion about. And again, it's not in case of serious self-defense, certainly not in its own waters. So I think for many people around the world, increasingly, an image is emerging of Israel more or less as increasingly a rogue state, as a state that only knows one way to deal with things, disproportionate force and violence, and has no problem instrumentally using civilians to push for its ends. In other words, not rejecting the sanctity of civilian life, something that it always accuses its opponents of doing, but when in fact it's doing that right now as we speak. And basically what's happening around the world and in the United States today is that people are no longer buying the old story. They're not buying the story of Israel under siege, Israel the victim, only acting as security, and they're actually seeing a reversal of that image. And we're seeing this through movements around the world uh, many of you probably know of some of these actions. Israeli government certainly knows about these actions. Ships aren't, ship, Israeli ships' goods are not being uh, let into the ports. Um, unions, uh, teachers' unions, uh, workers' unions, other folks are disinvesting from pensions that have anything to do with Israel's military, and the list goes on. That's probably the first thing, I think, the strategic context that's happening. Now we get to the other side of the picture, though, which is on the other hand, the second development, or really non-development, is the fact that we have an Obama administration who's really not moving with world opinion and not really, really not moving with American popular opinion as well. And instead, um, it's not seizing this moment and pushing for an end to Israel's occupation, which I think, as we all know, is in the best interest of Israel and the United States and, of course, the Palestinians. But it's rather offering a tepid and warmed-over return to a peace process. I'm not sure if any of you know what it's being called this time around. It's called the proximity talks. Have you been noticing, have you been daily paying attention to these serious talks that are, that are going on where the two sides don't even meet in the same room to talk? In fact, they shuttle information probably through pigeons or something. I'm not sure how it works. Um, and they're even minimizing criticism of Israel's recent actions, not only Gaza, but the flotilla raid, etc. These actions that are mobilizing people around the world. And they're defending the United, uh, Israel at the United Nations, watering down resolutions once again, and so on. So what gives? What explains this? What's going on? 
It's a question that a lot of people bring up. For some, it must be the Israel lobby. This is the Mearsheimer Walt thesis. I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with this text. It's a book called The Israel Lobby um, by these two political scientists, one from Harvard, one from University of Chicago. And they argue that what explains this very one-sided and, in their view, counterproductive embrace of Israel right or wrong, lack of support and, and effort at pushing Israel to make the right choice, which would be seek peace with its uh, Palestinian neighbors. What explains this for them, and also not to mention the most special rel relationship in the world, really, in terms of uh, financial support, US being, uh, Israel being the number one recipient of US aid, um, favorable loans, um, we, the list goes on and on. Um, what they argue is that it must be the pow power of the Israel lobby, this network of actors. APAC would be the most familiar name probably to many of you, ADL. Uh, et cetera. There's a whole series of organizations, maybe we'll hear uh, Richard talk more about some of them. But they believe that these organizations, what they call this network they call the Israel Lobby, has a stranglehold on U.S. foreign policy. That that's what prevents it from changing, from, from stepping forward, moving ahead, um, pressuring Israel to make peace, et cetera. It's a serious argument. It should be read and debated. I respect these guys. Um, as a political science PhD and student, I remember reading their books. I always found them to be really conservative, which I think a lot of people overlook, actually. Um, but it must, be, it must be grappled with. However, in my view, the notion that the lobby is all powerful and has a stranglehold on, on US foreign policy, I think, is, is at best partial. It's only part of the story. In fact, I'd be happy if that were the whole story. It's kind of an optimistic view, I, I think. In fact, I think there are much broader and deeper structures that have compelled this relationship, which I think has become self-destructive both to Israel and the United States, and certainly um, on the backs of Palestinians. I think there are, there are other issues that we have to consider. There's no question that there's a powerful ne network of interest, interest groups that pressure, especially in Congress, right? Within minutes, you know, 80 or 90 senators are signing on to some resolution saying, you know, uh, Palestinians are demanding diapers be brought into Gaza and this might be a form of terrorism or something <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> that they come up with all the time because as you probably know, diapers consistently have been um, uh, disallowed from entering Gaza. I'm not sure what Israel's rationale there was. These could be made into some kind of weapon used against, against it. it. Um, not to mention coriander, not to mention a whole list of absolutely absurd items that Israel is prevented from entering into Gaza, which I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, later, which goes to show you that the Israeli siege of Gaza has actually very little to do with weapons and quite a lot to do with, again, the same old story, punishing a population, trying to get them to uh, act instrumentally against the Hamas leadership and government and so on. But anyway, back to the lobby argument, uh, a whole group of uh, that, that Mearsheimer and Walt's argument, there's some basis to it, certainly in Congress and certainly in civil society. I would say, actually, probably, and maybe Rich will talk more about this, uh, immense power within the, the Jewish American community, sort of policing and so on. Um, yet, oh yeah, not to mention uh, Aaron David Miller, for example, uh, who was a Clinton uh, administration uh, on the peace team. And he basically said in his most recent book, which is quite an interesting book, actually, he said, you know, I figured now that basically we were serving as Israel's lawyer, right? This is someone with very deep ties to Israel. But nevertheless, um, I believe that this network has only gained the power that it, that it has because it had something to market. It was selling a product, Israel, that far more powerful interests actually were buying and wanted to buy. And most importantly, we know that the central source of U.S. foreign policy, the central concern of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, always has been and will be into the future, is, of course, petroleum resources in the region. There's no other, there's no other issue that compels us into that region like control of oil. Oil is the strategic commodity par excellence. And after 1967 is when the U.S. became the dominant power in the Middle East. The dominant power taken over from Britain to control the region's oil supplies. And in that context, Israel proved itself to be a very valuable ally. 
It defeated the only real challenge to the Arab oil regimes, Egypt and Syria, radical Arab nationalism. It destroyed them in a very brief war. Um, and in that sense, made itself available as a strategic partner to the United States in, in its regional hegemony. And I believe that's the fundamental source of the power, the, the relationship between Israel and the United States, because after that moment is when you see the aid level skyrocket, you see the embrace, the special relationship emerge, and that's actually when you see the emergence of, of the, the power to the extent that it has, of a kind of very forceful network of, of, of interests in Washington sort of pushing levers, going after politicians that disobeyed sort of the, the party line. In other words, Israel became integrated in the U.S. national security state as an active willing partner. That means that the national security state actually has a consistent interest in support for Israel. Um, and really a consistent interest not necessarily in supporting Palestinian rights. Now, some might argue that the U.S. pro-Israel position in denial of Palestinian rights creates instability. And this is only partly true if you understand the nature of the order that the U.S. is presiding over. Largely a group of undemocratic regimes in the Middle East who don't really care that much about public opinion until it really begins to threaten their interests, which is why, as kind of part of the bargain, the U.S. has always had this interminable peace process, kind of the peace process industry, right? I mean, how long have we been engaged in the peace process industry, really? 25, 30 years? What has it gotten us, really? It's not been about peace, it's been about process. And that process has primarily been a salve to the Arab regimes that we control um, in a way to sort of keep the level of anger at them down. That leads me to the second powerful interest that I think uh, uh, Israel was marketed to and, and markets itself to, which is the military industrial complex. Israel has become one of the major players in the military industry, which is really when you add it up, ounce for ounce, pound for pound, really are the most powerful interest group in Capitol Hill today. And uh, in a variety of ways, much of that aid that's sent to Israel actually is recycled back into the military industrial complex through uh, contracts and so on, buying weapons and, and et cetera. And also I would argue that instability in the region is very good for business for the military industrial complex. In fact, Israel being somewhat of a destabilizer is actually very good because then the Arab countries, what do they need? They need weapons. Where do they go? They buy them from us, okay? So I think there's real institutional interests that back a very one-sided, hearty embrace of Israel, right or wrong, okay? There are different Israels, as I said, but really the status quo Israel. The lobby had a product to sell. I believe that that's really one of the main structural issues that confronts any president that wants to change the course. And that certainly has confronted Obama today, to the extent that he wants to change course. But I'll go, maybe I'll go into this later because I'm going to need to zero in on getting to my main sort of point and then wrap up. But, um, but I think that's changing now. I think there are cracks in the edifice going on right now, just to, just to mention in all three of those areas, actually, that I just mentioned. First of all, you're seeing growing whispers, rumors, discussions at especially military level that, that Israel is actually not a strategic asset. It's becoming a strategic liability. Petraeus recently went to Capitol Hill and he said, look, when Israel does these provocative actions, it rebounds on us. This is bad. What are you going to do about it, Obama? Do you remember that when Petraeus came in and so on? Um, that's, that's tip of the iceberg. Uh, I hear from military people down in the Olympia area, others, Anthony Korsman, a very, very well-known conservative military analyst, he recently came out, big broadside, said, it's not a strategic asset when it acts like this. Time to, time to shift. That's one thing. The second thing is military industrial complex is having some problems with Israel. Uh, not only is Israel becoming a competitor to the American military weapons sellers, but it's also becoming a very independent actor. Now, it's not, Israel has every right to do this, but Israel has been determined to try and sell a variety of weapon system packages to China over the past three to five years. And the American folks, for a variety of reasons, are getting very angry about that. You might see this bubble up. Lastly, though, the most interesting thing is to the extent that there is a pro-Israel lobby composed of those particular organizations, and I think there is a network of shared interests there, basically supporting sort of a right-wing Israeli agenda, uh, greater Israel project, occupation, settlement, et cetera, um, is that you're getting dissent from the inside. In fact, you're seeing the rise now of a younger generation, particularly, not only though, 
of younger Jewish Americans who are saying, these institutions don't stand for me, they don't represent me, and so on. Peter Beinert of the New Republic, very you know, staunchly pro-Israel writer, he's actually written a, a very searing article in New York Review of Books recently that, that's documented this change. Um, probably best associated with groups like J Street, this new, um, sort of they call themselves a pro-Israel, pro-peace lobby. Um, and, uh, and I think they're the tip of the iceberg. So we're seeing cracks in the edifice. Now it brings me to Obama, what's the problem? Well, obviously he's up against very entrenched institutionalized interests to change course. But I think there's a further problem. Obama's strategy. Obama's sense of strategy seems to be always the same, which is see where, what the center is and try and push with persuasion, with persuasion and oratory and other sorts of new ways of people to meet and dialogue, move it over a little bit this way. Hasn't worked, didn't work with healthcare. Didn't work with a lot of, well, maybe it barely worked with healthcare. Didn't work with a lot of things, it's not working here. Um, I could go in more into detail of his strategy, but if you remember, after his famous speech in Cairo where he said all the right things, he, what was his strategy? Well, he picked a settlement freeze. He said, let's freeze settlements, which is really nothing, right? It's, it's, it's minimal, freezing. I mean, the obstacle to peace are those settlements, the infrastructure, the wall, the whole, the whole project in the occupied territories that prevents Palestinians from having an independent state alongside Israel. Yet, he just went for a settlement freeze and actually, it was kind of smart, to, it, if you think about it, which is that what he was trying to do was get an issue that basically the Israeli government, no matter how right-wing it is, and it's the most in history, and the pro-Israel Congress, that they'd have to sort of say, well, I guess that's not so bad. And then he thought he could get the ball rolling. Do you see the idea? Wedge issue, get the ball rolling. Suddenly they don't have red lines anymore. Settlement freeze, no longer red line. He thought he could do that. But he didn't back it up with any force. He didn't back it up with any threats, mild threats like, We'll dock the amount of aid we give you to the extent that you are spending in the occupied territories, in the settlements, something like that. My view is that would have made all the difference in the world. Because most Israelis, as we know, care deeply, especially now feeling under siege, because they're losing the battle of public opinion right now, as I've just articulated. Maybe some would deny that. I think you're living in another reality. Um, they're very worried about losing the United States as their primary backer and supporter and a president who would come in and actually break the ice and say, yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got that covered, but here's, here's what we need, I think could make all the difference in the world, especially backing that up with some kind of uh, a real compulsion. So um, what are we going to see in the next few months? Well, here's plan two, you know, because Obama lost that round. Netanyahu just dug in his feet and people in Congress basically wrote their letters and so on. Um, here's what we're going to see. Within three months after these proximity talks go nowhere, no one expects them to go anywhere, um, in September, um, Obama is going to actually go to the UN. That's what they're talking about now. And he's going to go to the UN and he's going to, once again, the same idea, use his oratory, step up, and he's actually going to call for an international peace conference. It's going to be interesting. I'm not going to totally oppose it. However, once again, the proof in the pudding will be whether he's going to back that up not only a carrot, but also with sticks, whether he's actually going to step forward and make that a reality. I have my doubts right now. At the same time, I'll be very interested to see him expose even further the cracks that we're seeing right now as we move forward. We can talk more about the details later, but I need to, to finish, so thank you very much. Richard, if you can come in on what's going on in the Israeli society. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to express my uh, appreciation to uh, Brenda Bentz and uh, St. Mark's. Uh, when I came to them with the idea of doing this program, uh, they were excited about it, and uh, we all became partners in it. And I also want to thank all of you uh, for coming out for, um, for this event. Um, I am a blogger, as you know, and I've been doing this since 2003, and when uh, <clears throat> horrific events happen on the ground in the Middle East, um, I no longer feel satisfied just sitting at my desk and writing blog posts about it, and I feel like we have to do something, and uh, I'm so grateful that, that this event was the result of that. Um, tonight, I have the unenviable task of telling you about the state of the state of Israel. 
and it's not good. Um, I've been following Israeli politics since 1967, and I don't think I've ever felt more alarmed about what's happening. We all knew when Bibi Netanyahu became prime minister that we were in for a far-right government. But sad to say, I think we were spoiled by the more centrist governments that preceded them. We thought that since both Ariel Sharon and Ehud Olmert were former Likud political leaders, that Bibi would be a little bit more conservative, but kind of in the same mold. Well, he's broken the mold. Um, and he's been a revelation and not a good one. Under his rule, uh, the Israeli peace and human rights community has come under fire as never before. The leader of the New Israel Fund in Israel, which is a relatively tame advocate for Israeli civil society and democracy, was vilified in all the major Israeli newspapers in an ad that displayed a caricature of her, caricature of her with a rhino horn sprouting from her head. And it was a very ugly a display that reminded me of the Nazi um, anti-Jewish propaganda publication, Die Sturmer. And I'm not the only person who's thought of that comparison in case that shocks some of you. Israelis themselves uh, noted that. Recently, an Israeli journalist writing for Haaretz was forced into exile because he received secret documents from an Israeli soldier. Those memos documented that the Israeli army was violating a Supreme Court ruling which said that they could not kill Palestinian militants if there, were, if there was a chance of apprehending them without violence. And they did that. They, they, they killed uh, in cold blood several, uh, Israeli, uh, several Palestinian militants in direct violation of the Supreme Court ruling. The documents documented that. Um, the Israeli uh, Shin Bet went after the soldier and uh, is, she is now on trial, and uh, the punishment could be life in prison. Now, she is an Israeli Daniel Ellsberg. The Nixon administration attempted to do the same thing to Daniel Ellsberg, and they failed. I'm not as confident that the result will be the same in Israel, because it's a total different environment for, for civil liberties in Israel. Um, Uri Blau, the, the journalist, as I, as I mentioned, um, a terrific journalist, a, a fearless journalist, is now uh, in fear of being prosecuted himself. If you can imagine um, the reporter who wrote uh, the, the article in the New York Times about the Pentagon Papers, if you can imagine that reporter being prosecuted in addition to Ellsberg, you have an idea of what uh, is faced by these people. An Israeli-Palestinian Knesset member named Hanin Zwabi uh, joined the Gaza flotilla and she sailed on the ship, the Mavi Mamara. If she'd been a regular Israeli citizen, she would have been imprisoned for doing this. She had parliamentary immunity, and that protected her. When she returned to the Knesset, the right-wing members of the Knesset called her a traitor and a killer. When she rose to defend herself before the body, all hell broke loose. A Jewish female Knesset member lunged at her and would have taken her down if she hadn't have been restrained by uh, the Knesset security. Everyone knows who knows anything about the Israeli Knesset is that it's a fractious, dysfunctional place. And, and there's a lot of disagreement and arguments and name calling and uh, all sorts of shenanigans go on there. But this is a different level of magnitude. Even an Israeli TV newscaster described what happened as near lynching. And I saw the, the video, and um, you know, some people in Israel, some people on the right uh, try to poo-poo what, what happened, but this woman was really um, in danger. I mean, uh, nobody ever actually you know, got their hands on her or, or did her any harm, but uh, there was real deep, deep hate uh, that day. The Israeli security apparatus has gone to war against the Israeli-Palestinian political leadership those Palestinians that live in Israel. This goes back to an announcement in 2007 by Yuval Diskin, the Shin Bet uh, director, who said publicly that he planned to wage an all-out war against the Israeli Palestinians. He viewed even legal activities by Israeli Palestinian political parties as a threat to the existence of the State of Israel. 
and he said that he would do everything in his power. And by that, I interpreted that to mean everything legal and everything, I don't know what the word would be, not illegal, whatever you want to, you know, you can fill in the blank there. But um, you can imagine what a secret service can do in, in a country like Israel. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the outcome uh, of, of that plan that he's uh, implemented. In the past month, the Shin Bet arrested the director of an Israeli-Palestinian NGO whose name uh, is Amir Mahul. They came to his Haifa apartment in the middle of the night. They ransacked it. They took away all the electrical equipment in his home, including the uh, computers and, and cell phones of his teenage daughters. They took him to prison. They held him incommunicado for three weeks, couldn't talk to his family, couldn't talk to his lawyers. Um, they slapped a gag order. And this is a very important uh, facet of how the intelligence service works in Israel that we're, not, we're less familiar with. Anytime they deem something to be secret, it becomes secret and it is, you're not allowed to know about it if you're an Israeli. Well, uh, let's say you're, you're allowed to know about it as long as you have the right uh, ways to get the information. But no journalist, no newspaper, no television station is allowed to report on anything that the Secret Service, the, uh, the intelligence service says is, is secret. So a gag order was slapped. Nobody knew that he had been arrested, that he had been disappeared. Luckily, I have been developing some Israeli sources who understand the importance of getting this information out. And so because Israeli journalists cannot report on issues that are so critical to Israel like this, others like me have become surrogate journalists for Israel. And I was able to report the identity of Amir Mahul. Um, the gag order was then rescinded by the, uh, by the Shin Bet. So now we at least know that he was in prison. Um, the Shin Bet kept under secret uh, the identity of the supposed Hezbollah spy who was recruiting Amir Mahul, uh, I'm, I'm putting recruiting in, in, uh, in quotation marks, uh, to become a spy against Israel. I discovered that this alleged Hezbollah spy is really a landscape gardener in Amman um, who runs an Arab environmental NGO um, and didn't really seem like Hezbollah material to me, frankly. Um, but despite the ludicrousness of the charges against Mahul, it doesn't stop the Shin Bet from torturing him, or depriving him of sleep for three weeks, uh, tying him in a chair that was bolted to the, to the ground so that he couldn't move, and basically putting in front of him a narrative of what he did, his illegal activities, that he then had to sign off on. And to me, this reminds me of what I'm seeing on uh, television and in the newspaper about uh, trials, these show trials that are going on in, in Tehran. I don't really see very much different. Um, Mahul uh, has not, he's just about scheduled to go on trial. It was supposed to start a few days ago and now it's gonna start in a few days. We'll have to see how that, um, how that comes out. But that is one of the purposes, uh, my purposes as a blogger, is to try to act as a, um, as a guardian for civil liberties for people like him. This is how low Israel has gone. In an effort to combat the international campaign to hold Israel accountable for its actions in Gaza after in, during Operation Cast Lead, it's, Israel has inflicted upon itself and the rest of the world a sort of pathological madness. It called Richard Goldstone, the judge who is the author of the UN report on the war, a traitor to his people accused him of committing a blood libel against Israel, accused him, uh, this is Alan Dershowitz's term, was um, the word Moser, accused him of being a Moser. This is uh, a Jew who, during the Holocaust, uh, ferreted out other Jews who were living in secret and reported them uh, to, to the Gestapo, uh, you know, resulting in their deaths. Um, Israel and its supporters tarnished Goldstone's record as a South African anti-apartheid judge and they compared him to Joseph Mengele. Some of us attended the Sabil conference a couple of months ago. Uh, one of the highlight uh, speeches was by Neve Gordon, a professor at Ben Gurion University. Um, several months ago, he electrified uh, people who were interested in this issue 
by uh, announcing in the pages of the Los Angeles Times that he supported the global BDS movement, the boycott divestment sanctions movement. He received a huge level of, of hate and vilification in Israel for what he did. The president of his university basically made a distinction between academic freedom and irresponsibility and said that there's a red line that a faculty member may not cross and that Gordon had crossed the line. And that basically free speech and, uh, was not an absolute because there were considerations that had to be um, given to the uh, security of the state. And she claimed that a university named after the first, pre the first uh, prime minister of the state of Israel couldn't harbor a faculty member who attacked the foundation of the Zionist movement through this BDS movement. Neve Gordon, I'm sorry to tell you, uh, received a death threat a few days ago. Uh, I don't know if it was a serious death threat, but I take every threat like that to be a serious, potentially serious one. The, pre the same president that I mentioned did write a letter to the faculty and the campus community which, um, um, which attacked the, the notion of, of, of this threat of violence against anyone in the community. But she again basically blamed Neve Gordon for bringing this on himself by saying that we have to make a distinction between our obligations to Israeli democracy and our obligations to the security of the state. We have a fine line to walk and we can't, we, can, we have to walk on the, that line and we can't uh, fall you know, too much on one side or the other. This is a distinction that I completely uh, reject and I'm sure that um, Steve would, would uh, join me in that as, uh, as a member of the uh, faculty as well. Um, if we add to that that a British trustee of the same university um, called for a colleague of Neve Gordon to die because he criticized Israeli policy in a, um, a TV4 do uh, documentary in England. Um, after that uh, comment by the trustee, 140 faculty members wrote to the same president and said, this is terrible, what are you going to do about it? She ignored them. Now this is a serious problem. It's a problem, of course, in terms of academia and free speech and academic freedom, but it's a problem for the notion of Israeli democracy, which is uh, under terrible threat. In light of the repression and paranoia I've outlined, it isn't surprising that the IDF perpetrated the debacle and uh, the Gaza flotilla. I personally don't know exactly what happened, but in my most charitable interpretation, I imagine that when the commando team faced resistance from some passengers and it believed that some of its members had been either kid captured or, or kidnapped, um, that they may have gone berserk. Um, Israel had, the Israeli army has a, a, a credo that they don't leave anyone behind. And, uh, you know, with the, the, the uh, the capturing of uh, Gila Shalit and, and incidents like this happening, there's a terrific sensitivity to that. And I think that there was just some kind of uh, manic reaction happened um, in which the discipline of whatever discipline they had when they went into the, uh, the, uh, the operation just completely collapsed and I think that's possibly how these people were killed. I don't personally believe that they went into the operation planning to kill people. Um, but that doesn't really matter. The outcome was that they did that. And, 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 and uh, the fact that Israeli spokespeople before the operation began said we are prepared to use whatever force is necessary to prevent this uh, flotilla from reaching its goal really set the stage for what did happen. Um, now I'd like to uh, have a word about the actual the Israeli investigation of the, uh, the attack. As you know, Israel proposed that it would investigate and opposed the idea of an international investigation. And the Obama administration said, yeah, that sounds good with us. That sounds good to us. Um, not surprisingly. And so two, uh, three Israelis were appointed to be on the commission and two foreign observers. The first Israeli appointed was a, uh, the, the chair of the commission, a 75-year-old uh, retired Supreme Court justice 
who in the Israeli press is noted as someone who is always in favor of free speech unless it involves national security. <laughs> in which case he changes his mind very quickly. Um, the second member of the panel is an 86-year-old retired general who in 1943, after a series of uh, attacks against Jewish women um, in, uh, in pre-state Palestine by Palestinians, actually castrated a Palestinian male villager who was accused of perpetrating one of these attacks. The third uh, member of the panel is a 94-year-old, you get, get a pattern here? 94-year-old former Israeli diplomat who, um, after the massacre at Kibya, which happened in the, I think, 1953, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and was commanded by Ariel Sharon, who was a young officer at the time. A uh, terrible massacre happened in, in uh, you know, what's now the West Bank. And um, this 94-year-old uh, diplomat at the time said to the Israeli Prime Minister, I know how we'll deal with it. We'll tell the world that it wasn't our army that did it. It was our civilians who were just so fed up with attack, cross-border attacks. We couldn't control them. You know, it's just, you know, and we'll, we'll show you that we're serious about this by saying we're going to punish these, uh, these Israeli civilians. Um, this doesn't give you a whole lot of confidence that we're going to really get to the bottom of anything in this investigation. Um, if you look at one of the foreign observers, it's Lord uh, David Trimble uh, from Northern Ireland. He just co-founded a European pro-Israel advocacy group, uh, which their mission is to oppose the delegitimization of Israel in Europe. The other foreign observer is uh, the, one of the top senior judges in the Canadian Army, former uh, top judges. So you get the picture of the composition of the uh, commission. It's really, uh, I would say the fix is in. Um, and the fact that the US government has uh, said that this looks fine to us really is, is, is shameful because there is only one investigation that will work and that's a UN investigation, an international investigation. Ban Ki-moon already has an investigation, has the members of a panel in place, the chair of a panel in place. That's eventually what is gonna have to happen um, and we're, we're just sort of uh, dithering here um, by giving any credence at all to the Israeli investigation. I'd like to close by talking a little bit about uh, US policy from the perspective of an American Jew who had a lot of hope when Barack Obama was campaigning uh, and when he came to power that he would take the bull by the horns, that he would do what it, whatever it took to bring a peace settlement. We all uh, who have been watching this conflict for decades know what's failed. I thought finally we have someone who's gonna know how to avoid all of that and will succeed. I thought he had backbone. I hoped he had backbone. Um, but it turns out I've been very, very disappointed by the, uh, by the Obama administration. The, uh, some of the other things that our administration has done is that we've opposed the Goldstone Report and we've threatened that if it went, ever went to the UN Security Council, we would veto it. Um, when uh, Turkey and the nations of the world demanded an international investigation of the Marmara attack, um, as I mentioned to you just now, uh, we were on Israel's side on that. When things got hot and heavy in the aftermath of the killings and pressure mounted to end the Gaza siege, did our administration call for an end of the siege and an end of the suffering? No. We wanted to calibrate. We wanted to ease the suffering. We wanted to let in the cinnamon and let in the coriander and let in some uh, cement to rebuild some houses. This is just tinkering around the edges. When you need a fundamental change, we need to end the siege. That's the only way to address this, this problem in its, in its root causes. This has been an administration satisfied with half measures, and there are times when half measures may work if a crisis isn't severe, but we're way past severe when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The situation calls for backbone, fortitude, instead we get waffling and zigzagging. I want to note um, 
uh, as I conclude my remarks, that today is the fourth anniversary of the capture of Gilad Shalit. He's been a captive for four years. And during that time, there have been negotiations between Hamas and Israel over his fate. Essentially, Hamas demanded the release of uh, hundreds of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. And um, they dickered back and forth, and they came up with, uh, Israel said it would release 325, and, the, and Hamas said they wanted 100, 150 more. Israel balked. There's been no agreement. He's basically in cold storage. I hate to say it that way. Um, even though everything about this case is in a fog, we don't know who's at fault, is it Hamas, is it Israel, it does seem that there, at several times, several points, there was a possibility he would be freed, and it's really a tragedy that he hasn't been. I want Gilad Shalit to return to the bosom of his family, but I also want Israel to recognize Hamas and end the siege. I want the residents of Steyrot not to suffer under missiles uh, sent from Gaza, but I also want the residents of Gaza to be free from paralyzing fear and anticipation of the next war, which, if there isn't peace, will surely come. There is a way out of this mess. The 2002 Saudi initiative proposed Arab acceptance of Israel in return for withdrawal to the 1967 borders. I call them near 67 borders because it's not exactly 100% return, but very close to it. Israel rejected this peace plan. Sharon rejected it. Olmert rejected it. Netanyahu hasn't even bought, deigned to reject it. He just hasn't dealt with it. Um, but, the, but the plan's still on the table. The Arabs are still willing. There's only one way to save Israel, and that's to make peace. Everyone knows the parameters of a future agreement. The only question is how many have to die before Israel comes to its senses and agrees to compromise. And to quote a Jewish saying, may this happen speedily and in our day. Thank you. Now, David, give us a first-hand account of the Botilla. I have the, uh, the, the sense that, that some of you might not have come a year ago. Uh, perhaps all of you would, but uh, I, I have the feeling that the flotilla, despite the, the tragic loss of life and the, uh, the turning back of the cargoes to, uh, uh, to a very needy uh, population, I, I think that the, the positive side is obviously that the, the situation there has uh, drawn the attention of the entire world and uh, I hope there are meetings like this being held throughout the world, and I, apparently there are, so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Uh, in the middle of May, I, I flew to Crete to join the crew of two 75-foot U.S. flagships, the Challengers 1 and 2. They had both been purchased by the Free Gaza Movement and were registered in Delaware. The plan was for them to join a multi-ship flotilla rendezvousing off the coast of Cyprus before proceeding to Gaza. In the summer of 2008, I had also visited Crete as a crew aboard one of a two-ship flotilla that would eventually break the 41-year siege of Gaza. The Free Gaza and the Liberty, organized by the Free Gaza movement, were tired old 60-foot vessels, top speed six knots. During the night when we were approaching Gaza, our electronics were jammed after being threatened by Israeli naval ships unless we turned back. But we pushed on, and as the sun rose and our radios revived, we received word that the Israelis would allow us to enter Gaza for humanitarian reasons. Actually, the word was spread by, <coughs> by Al Jazeera, and they got the word out. So, I dare say that uh, for the 44 crew and passengers aboard, our, <coughs> our arrival in Gaza will remain one of life's more memorable occasions. We could only carry limited cargo on our old boats, but for the thousands of Palestinians who cheered us into the port, we brought hope and an assurance that the outside world had not forgotten them. 
I returned twice more to Gaza that year, once before and once after our national elections. The support for Obama was overwhelming, based on the hope that he would introduce a new and more equitable policy in the Middle East than <coughs> demonstrated by earlier administrations. I went out twice with the Gazan and fishermen on these trips since the discovery of natural gas in 1999 the Gazan, in the Gazan waters. The Israelis had begun an increasingly stringent policy of attacking fishing boats that travel more than six miles from shore, despite the Oslo Accord that permitted fishing and other commercial activities in a corridor extending out 20 miles. Over a dozen fishermen have been killed and 200 plus wounded, and scores of boats captured or destroyed. I had hoped to be a deterrent to such attacks by being clearly visible on deck with his old white hair, but the bullets skipped within feet of the boat and the attacks with high pressure water hoses continued. After these first three trips, other free Gaza movement ships were attacked. One was rammed and nearly sunk. Others were captured and taken to Israel. It became apparent that a new approach must be tried, and thus the idea of a multinational flotilla was born. Over the past year, support was generated from Malaysia to Turkey to Greece to the United States, plus a host of other nations. The Turkish charity IHH arranged for the passenger ship Mavi Mamara and two cargo vessels. IHH is a Turkish NGO established in 1992 and offers humanitarian relief in more than 100 countries. His activities have been banned by Israel, which considers it close to Hamas. The Greeks provided a cargo and passenger vessel. The Free Gaza Movement arranged for the cargo ship Rachel Corey and two passenger boats, Challenger 1 and 2. Both the Rachel Corey and the Challenger 2 were delayed by mechanical problems. The Rachel Corey was later captured as it attempted to reach Gaza a few days after the flotilla was attacked. The six ship flotilla gathered off the coast of Cyprus and headed together for the 200 mile trip to, uh, trip to Gaza. Both challengers had developed mechanical problems within hours of leaving Crete. Israeli Colonel Itzhak Turgaman hinted of sabotage saying, they took care of them, referring to his own <laughs> military. In an example of their familiarity with the ships, Kevin Nish of Victoria made a discovery aboard the Mavi Mamara during the attack. Uh, a couple of the Israeli commandos had been captured on the top deck and taken below. A notebook fell out of one of their knapsacks and Kevin picked it up. Among other information were detailed diagrams of both Challengers 1 and 2 and photographs of the three German parliamentarians who had come aboard Challenger 1 only the previous day. Pictures of it are shown on a one hour film of the attack available online and it's well worth seeing. It's uh, quite an amazing film that they managed to smuggle out. Realizing that the Israelis were soon going to take over the ship, he wisely abandoned the notebook. As the Challenger 2 had neared the flotilla in international waters, a Cypriot police helicopter hovered above us and a patrol boat approached the captain. Approached. The uh, captain felt he had to go into port for repairs, but thought he would be free to leave again since it was, a, since it was an emergency. The other passengers and I were concerned that we might never be allowed to leave Cyprus, so we asked uh, to be transferred to the nearby Mavi Memara. Once aboard, we were carefully frisked and our bags open for inspection. A sheath knife attached to uh, my rucksack was removed. They obviously did not want weapons brought on the ship. About 580 <laughs> persons were aboard, including a large press contingent. Passengers came from 35 countries ranging from Malaysia to Algeria, with the majority from Turkey. Conditions were crowded, but not uncomfortable. I was familiar with uh, Middle Eastern hospitality from my trips to Gaza, but the generous welcoming practice was even more apparent aboard the ship. A middle-aged Lebanese asked me to have tea and cookies at his table. A man from Yemen and another from Algeria joined us. 
<coughs> the Lebanese uh, kept a photograph in a nook by the porthole of four women. I asked, asked him about them, and he told me that they <coughs> were his wife and three daughters. He had gone to Chicago during the last war in Lebanon to seek better job opportunities. He had phoned his wife early in the morning and three hours later received a call from a neighbor. An Israeli shell had killed all four. His eyes welled, as did mine, and he was bringing 10,000 euros to distribute as gifts in Gaza. I spent two nights on the Mavi uh, <coughs> Mamara, and on the third day learned that the three German parliamentarians aboard the Challenger 1 wished to transfer to the Turkish ship. I joined two journalists and a young man from Maine trans and transferred to the smaller boat. As night fell, we could make out the navigation lights of the Israeli ships several miles ahead in a beam. About midnight, they began to radio us with warnings to turn back. Oweda Araf, the Free Gaza Movement chairperson, responded that it was illegal to stop an unarmed civilian ship in international waters, and we were proceeding. I used a small digital recorder to uh, record these exchanges. I had placed a spot locator on the deck. This is a GPS that sends its location to a satellite, which in turn sends the information for distribution to pre-selected email addresses. I set the device to, tr uh, uh, to tracking so that it would send our location every 10 minutes. I had been told that the Israelis confiscated all camera tapes and chips after attacking a ship. I had reasonably, a reasonably sophisticated Canon video camera, but it used tape cassettes that would be hard to hide. So I chose, I chose to, uh, I, I, so I chose videos with my, I shot, I chose to shoot videos with my Sony point and shoot digital camera that used a ship I had a better chance of hiding. I succeeded in hiding it, but unfortunately the results proved better for sound than for picture. At about 4 a.m., we could see flares fired from boats ahead and then made out chase boats approaching us from either side. We had been at the back of the flotilla, now sped through it at top speed. We passed within 50 yards of the Mavi, which was already under attack. Fire hoses were being used against the attackers, who were responding with percussion gen grenades and paintball pellets. We could hear the helicopters approaching. Our captain, Dennis Healy, continued at about 18 knots, not fast enough to lose the Israelis, but by zigzagging, he made it difficult for them to board. We received a radio call from a frigate ahead of us, which threatened to ram us if we did not stop. Dennis had been rammed on a previous trip and almost sunk, so he elected to stop. We had placed balloon fenders, overturned chairs, and tables on the ship's walkways as symbolic resistance. Haweda and two other women stayed on deck, screaming at the Israelis to stay off. I had planned to go to the cabin, take pictures of the Israelis smashing the door, and then try to hide the chip. <clears throat> a uh, percussion grenade landed about a foot in front of me. As I entered the cabin, uh, uh, as I entered the cabin, once I locked the, the heavy glass door, the Israelis smashed it and entered the cabin. In the confusion, I was able to extract and conceal the chip in deep trouser pockets. The women outside continued to scream at the attackers until, their, until bags were placed over their heads and their hands bound. Some of the younger soldiers, soldiers brandished their tasers and automatic weapons under our noses until the commanding officer ordered them to back off. Another, another of them appeared to have no weapons but only a small Sony camcorder that he used to record our behavior during most of our trip to port. When relative calm had been restored, we were taken to the wheelhouse, frisked and relieved of all electronics, cameras, GPSs, etc. They looked through my wallet, examining my credit cards, cash, and driver's license, but returned it all intact. They carefully recorded all the confiscated uh, items before placing them in individual plastic bags and writing a number on each. I was number 17. The same number was placed on my luggage. We were assured that all would be returned before we left Israel. None of us have seen any of our belongings thus far. I have had roaming charges on my AT&T account for my iPhone from Tel Aviv. Another passenger has had charges on her Visa card 
including beer churches, beer purchases also in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Our consulate there is pursuing the matter. We reached Ashdod in about four hours and underwent a series of interrogations. The first step was another frisking at which time they took a contact sheet uh, I had in my pocket uh, with embassy and local uh, attorney's numbers. I asked for it back and was told uh, it would be returned after a copy was made. This proved to be the first in a series of gratuitous lies that characterized most of my encounters with Israeli officials. My first interrogator asked me with a straight face why I look so angry. <laughs> Since my ears were still ringing from the grenade, I thought I had misheard him and asked him to repeat himself. He did, and I asked him if he had been kidnapped 75 miles at sea by Somali pirate lookalikes, would he be all smiles? <laughs> he uh, responded that I was in I I Israel illegally. I could only shake my head and say the discussion was too ludicrous to pursue. <laughs> I asked for my contact sheet. He said it would be at the next table and my luggage would be on the bus and the checks in the mail. <laughs> Four more identical interrogations followed before I was directed towards the bus. Once outside the giant interrogation tent, I walked a gauntlet of official press and apparently off-duty military types capturing my perp walk on their home camcorders to show their cap the captive ter terrorists to their families that night. <laughs> at this point, I vented my outrage by shouting at them <clears throat> and to their cameras that much of the world has now come to view their country as people by thugs, pirates, and assassins who had lost any moral position they might have once claimed. My daughter saw the footage on the news with my lips moving, but the audio had been blanked out. <laughs> she was frequently asked about a big book I was carrying. It was The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope. <laughs> I had just completed a course on it on Orcas Island, but had not finished the book. Perfect jail reading, I thought. <laughs> I was ushered to a bus, uh, neither the promised bags nor the contact sheet, without the uh, promise bag or the contact sheet, and pushed into a narrow cell with six others from the Challenger. Two hours later, we reached uh, Ella prison in, in Beersheba. It was a large compound surrounded by high, high walls and barbed wire, and apparently able to hold thousands of prisoners. We were the first to reach a three-level cell block. Each cell held four prisoners with a toilet and a bunk bed. Eventually, uh, Greeks, Irish, Swedes, and other Americans joined us. A couple of Turks were brought in by mistake, and we learned from them about the killings aboard the Mavi. We were taken individually to a doctor who asked about uh, medical problems and medications, then to an intelligence officer whose questions I declined to answer, and finally to a judge who contended that I had been seized in a legal blockade and was now in is Israel illegally. I replied that the logic was out of Alice in Wonderland <laughs> and asked for legal, the legal basis in admiralty law. It's recognized by the US and by the UN. <clears throat> no chapter and verse were offered. But he asked if I wanted to leave Israel. I replied as soon as possible, once I was assured that all the prisoners would be released at the same time. He said that I would have to sign a paper in English at the airport saying that I, <coughs> I uh, uh, would consent to uh, deportation. I told him I would sign nothing <coughs> excuse me, without the advice of an attorney. He responded that if I insisted on an attorney, I would spend 30 more days in jail. <coughs> and uh, at the end of that 30 days, if I asked again, I would spend another 30 days. I asked him if this was an example of democracy in Israel and insisted on seeing an attorney plus a representative from my embassy. And as for the 30 uh, days, I had a thick book to read. <laughs> <laughs> and I was growing, <coughs> growing accustomed to the raw cucumbers that were the, the, the mainstay of our meal. At the end of the interview, I asked if he were really a judge. 
He insisted he was, <clears throat> though an Israeli since explained that he was on the lowest tier of judgeships. <laughs> I asked his name and he told me it would be on the transcript he was preparing. It was in Hebrew, but uh, I had it translated to Yosi Maimon. U.S. consulate officials and an attorney were finally left <clears throat> led into the cell block. Two days later, we were bused to Ben Gurion Airport. Here were the most unpleasant of all the officials we had encountered, pushing, goading, lying at every opportunity. Americans Paul LaRudy and Ken O'Keefe were badly beaten there for being uncooperative. I was directed to a table and told to sign <coughs> a consent to deportation. I insisted on a careful reading, carefully reading it, and then asked about my promised luggage. I was assured it would be on the plane. <laughs> I asked the officer why I should believe him since no one had spoken the truth since I arrived. <laughs> he repeated that it would be. I asked his name. Golan, he said. Like the heights? Yes. So I carefully wrote down that Mr. Golan had pr promised me that my luggage would be on the plane and adding that I was signing an, <coughs> the document under duress. I was then led to the plane where we sat for 12 hours until leaving for Istanbul without my luggage. Although it does not compare with the tragedy of the lives lost abo aboard the Mavi or with the ships and cargoes unable to reach Gaza, but in reflecting with others who had been captured, in reflecting about events, this gratuitous lying was consistently brought up as one of the most irritating aspects of the experience. Mendacity seems to have become the national basis for communication and is accepted as a natural expression. It is though the nation has lost its moral compass. This readiness to lie and deceive is exemplified in its national leadership. Netanyahu sets the tone for much of the country. Haaretz quotes former Clinton spokesman Joe Lockhart describing Netanyahu as one of the most obnoxious individuals you're going to come into. Just a liar and a cheat. He could open his mouth and you could have no confidence that anything that came out of his mouth would, was the truth. Another Haaretz article quotes Yitzhak Rabin's <coughs> widow Leah as saying, Benjamin Netanyahu is a corrupt individual, a contentious liar who is ruining everything about our society. Although he has come to personify the, the liar, he is by no means unique. Under Olmert, the Israelis agreed to a ceasefire in June 2009 with Hamas, who promised to stop firing rockets in exchange for an increase in, uh, in, <coughs> in truck traffic into Gaza from the then current 70 trucks a day to the pre-Hamas average of 900 per day. In addition, the Israelis agreed to conduct no military incursions into Gaza. Beginning with the ceasefire, the rockets dropped from the hundreds in previous months to five, to four, and finally one per month is confirmed by the Israeli Intelligence Center. These few numbers were despite increasingly strong measures by Hamas to curtail all firing by splinter groups. Shortly before the June ceasefire was signed, Defense Minister Barak had instructed the IDF to secretly prepare for an invasion of Gaza. On November 5, <clears throat> six Palestinians were killed by the IDF while supposedly looking for a tunnel under the border. After this provocation, the rockets began again immediately and became the justification for Operation Cast Lead that resulted in over 1,400 fatalities in Gaza. As for the truck traffic, it increased from 70 to 90 per day instead of the promised 900. But history is written by the victors or the loudest liars. The Israelis have described the bungled attack on the flotilla as a trap set by a terrorist lynch mob. And judging by the hero's welcome the returning soldiers received, this has become the accepted truth. As a result of this recurring pattern, I view the recent promise to reduce the restrictions on imports into Gaza with much, and I fear, justified skepticism. 
How <clears throat> did the mindset that substitutes the lie for meaningful policy evolve? While the U.S. cannot assume full responsibility, I am convinced that our willingness over the years to wink and blink at their egregious behavior, <clears throat> to veto again and again the UN, at the UN any proposal that might hold them accountable for past actions or restrict future conduct. Time and again, <clears throat> they have been able to commit horrendous misdeeds with impunity. To name a few, 1953, Kiba, 1956, Kufr Hassan, 1967, the USS Liberty, 1982, Sabran Shatila, the daily intrusions into Gaza and the home in <clears throat> the West Bank with beatings, kidnappings, and destruction of homes beyond number. We failed to support the Goldstone Report and did not insist on an international review of the attack on the flotilla. This unconditional support by the U.S. has encouraged their view that not only, the, not only has the lie become acceptable, but is often elevated to the truth. They flaunt their arrogance like a banner. But what does our continued automatic support for Israel cost us? As General Petraeus recently said, it is costing us the hearts and minds of many whom we hope to win over. I wrote a letter to President Obama before I left and asked my daughter to send it and to distribute it in the event of some misadventure on the trip. I'd like to read a portion of it. <clears throat> the Muslim world is filled with disparate factions, often divided by religious beliefs, clan allegiances, national and political interests. What we have seen time and time again, one of the few unifying issues is outrage at the perceived injustices imposed upon the Palestinians by the Israelis with the tacit support of the United States. This well-founded perception does not serve our country well. It is time we re-examine our policy of automatic support for Israel, Israeli policy, regardless of its transgressions of international standards and repeated demonstrations of moral turpitude. They are not an ally of whom we can be proud. So if you believe it's time to change our national policy, what, what can you do? Write to Obama. I never got an answer, but write anyway. Write to your senators and representatives. Support the Free Gaza and Free Palestine movements. Support your local organization here in Seattle. Come out to the demonstrations in Westlake. Support J Street as a growing voice against APAC. And by all means, support the BDS movement. Boycott, divest, sanction. It is already strong in Europe and is gaining strength here. A few days ago in Oakland, the longshoremen refused to cross a picket line of protesters demonstrating against an Israeli cargo ship. <laughs> this sort of behavior with economic consequences contributed to the end of apartheid in South Africa and the worldwide support it can, with worldwide support, it can also humble Israel, the latest apartheid state. Be vocal, be loud, be frequent and BDS. <laughs>
maybe grow and increase the mutual understanding of what's going on. And maybe that can promote some, uh, some improvement in uh, relationships. So he, he, knows, uh, he knows Richard, and I got a hold of Richard, and Richard said, oh, by the way, we have this event come, going on. Um, would you like to come? And I said, yes. Um, I, I was also really pleased to hear that this was uh, partially sponsored by the American Friends Service. I graduated from the Friends Boys School in Ramallah, so I owe you guys uh, a lot. So thank you. I'm not going to uh, discuss politics, maybe in the Q&A, if you guys want to get into politics, I'd be glad to uh, oblige. But I'm going to concentrate on the huma humanitarian aspects of what it's like and how the situation has degraded significantly over the years and why these latest measures that have been announced are really not going to solve anything. Um, so let me start with this story. In 1987, I, um, I was visiting, I was here in college visiting for the summer and I used to be able to, uh, to drive our car from Ramallah, which is where we used to live, take my dad to work in East Jerusalem, um, take the car to Gaza, the, if you've ever been to, to, the, to Gaza recently, you know that now there's a huge, basically international border called Erez. Um, at that time, there used to be a very simple kind of uh, road checkpoint. And you typically just drove through that and went to Gaza, did whatever you wanted to do. Um, and I used to go get something done, drive back to Jerusalem, pick my dad up from work, and go home. This trip that I'm describing is impossible today. It, you, you just literally cannot get this accomplished today. Um, Driving to Jerusalem is a nightmare from, from the West Bank. There's the wall. You need to get permits to make that 20-minute journey from Ramallah to Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is still a center of, of education, a center of commerce. Uh, a lot of our best hospitals are still in Jerusalem, so now patients uh, don't have free access to these things. Um, a few years later, I... Um, so 1987 was the year before the Intifada. My plan was to graduate, go home, and, uh, and work for a while, and then come back to go to grad school. Um, so I, I wasn't planning. I w didn't apply to graduate schools or anything. And I, the Intifada happened, and I called my, my family, and they said, no, don't come. I said, why? They said, well, you, at the very least, there's no work. And in the worst case, you can get killed. So I stayed in the U.S., had to find work, um, found a job, um, was sponsored to get permanent residence through my employer. Um, so I ended up here, uh, to cut a long story short. Um, my mother was, uh, so my dad was a surgeon in Jerusalem. He retired, um, and we decided that he's going to retire back in Gaza. Unfortunately, uh, shortly uh, after the Intifada, my, well, my mother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, and the, the significance of this, besides, the, of course, the human tragedy and the personal tragedy involved in watching your mom kind of uh, slowly uh, uh, fade away, um, is that at the end of this process, she had to be placed in a hospice. The hospice, uh, my dad was in Gaza already, and she had lived in this house of ours in Gaza for a short period of, of time. And forgive me if I get emotional, by the way. Um, she, uh, we ended up having to find a hospice for her because we could not find the right care for her in Gaza. So she was placed in a hospice near Jerusalem. And at that, at that time, Gaza was already um, under a situation of very strict movement of people. So my dad would apply for a permit to go visit my mom in this hospice. And sometimes he would wait for six months to be able to make that trip from Gaza to visit his wife, who's basically dying at a hospice uh, near Jerusalem. OK, um, I made the trip. I made a few trips back. Uh, there was a, a significant gap between 
1987 and the uh, next time that I visited. Um, um, I don't know which one I should start with. So there was one trip that, uh, a couple of trips that were really important. Uh, one was when my, dad, my mom's situation had deteriorated significantly, so I said I was a U.S. citizen by that time. Um, as soon as I got my citizenship, I told everyone that, hey, the first thing I'm going to do is to go visit my mom. Um, when you arrive as a U.S. citizen of Palestinian descent, of course, you get the royal, royal treatment um, at the airport, um, which, which is okay, I understand. Um, and I couldn't go directly to the West Bank to visit my mom. Once you arrive in Israel, if you're Palestinian, and if you're from Gaza specifically, you have to go to Gaza. You cannot be outside of the Gaza Strip without a permit. So you have to take a cab, go straight to Gaza, and enter Gaza. Now, getting out of Gaza is the challenge. <clears throat> a couple of days after I got there, there was an explosion in Jerusalem, so they closed the Gaza-Israel border permanently as a kind of collective punishment measure. Uh, if, there's an exp any, if there's any event, uh, a security event in Israel, the first thing they do is they close the Gaza Strip. Um, so I was there for about a month, unable to go see my mom. Of course, I had a job. Luckily, I had an employer who can sympathize. You know, I had only a couple weeks of vacation time. Um, Actually, that's a different story, sorry. I'm mixing things up. There are many stories. Um, in this particular case, I was actually in graduate school. I had quit my job, gone to graduate school. Um, so I, I was a US citizen. I called the, our embassy in Tel Aviv, and I said, hey, I'm a US citizen. I'm in the Gaza Strip. I'm trying to go visit my mom. Um, can I get any help from you? And the answer was no. Um, um, I, the person who answered the phone was Israeli, you can tell from the accent. Um, maybe, maybe she didn't feel like helping me, maybe it's policy, I don't know. But at the end of the day, I did not receive any help from our embassy in, in Tel Aviv. Um, I was really lucky, I was going to graduate school at Rice University, and if you, don't know, if you know something about Rice, they have the, the James Baker Institute for Public Policy. And the head of that, uh, that institute is uh, Edward Jerigian, who is an ex-ambassador, U.S. ambassador to uh, Israel and, and Syria. Um, so I, I was in touch with my, my advisor, and I said, listen, uh, John, I'm stuck. Uh, can you help me out in any way? And, and uh, it was very nice of John to kind of intervene on my behalf, and he went and had a chat with uh, Ambassador Jerigian. And um, a few days later, I got this phone call. Actually, the phone call was uh, received at my uncle's house. Um, and I got this message that someone from the foreign ministry is, is trying to get a hold of me. So it literally took an act of intervention at the highest level. And as a consequence, the guy, the guy that, I forgot the person's name. Um, he was a human being. He asked me, well, uh, where's your mom? What's her situation? How long would you like to visit her for? And I said, I just would like to visit her for a week. I got a, I got a permit. And when there's a closure, getting into the border is like, it's a, it's a no man's land. There's no one, absolutely no one crossing that, that border. Remind me in a few minutes to tell you what that border used to look like in the 1980s. Um, so I got the permit to exit. It was waiting for me at the area's checkpoint. I was able to uh, cross, get a taxi cab. Taxi cab took me uh, to Ramallah, and I was able to see my mom every day for a week, which was an amazing thing. Um, <clears throat> so now it was time to come back. Um, and again, you, took, you take the taxi cab. Um, you. Uh, you cross the border, you have to have this permit. If anyone stops you and you don't have this permit, you can bet that you're going to be harassed at the very least or taken to jail for a while. Uh, the US passport doesn't buy you anything in, the, uh, in, in those situations. So I, uh, I went in and I remember me walking through these alleys as 
you know, at the border crossing, and I remember soldiers with their M16s, and I remember giving my ID card uh, to this uh, soldier, and I remember the ID card kind of being thrown at me. They definitely weren't pleased, pleased to, that someone was able to get out. I don't know what it was. Or I, I caused them to, to do work that day. I don't know what it was. <laughs> You'd think that I'd, uh, I'd be a welcome change from the monotony of having nothing to do, but uh, it, didn't, it didn't work. Um, so I got home. Now the challenge, of course, is I have a wife. I'd like to go back to Houston so I can go back to school. How am I going to now get the next stage of this trip accomplished? Um, I was told you can't leave the Gaza Strip without getting a Palestinian passport. So you need to apply for a Palestinian passport. Um, I went through the process of applying to, for a Palestinian passport. Um, the Ares crossing remained closed for a long time, and at that, at that time there was a, uh, you know, remember this is post the Oslo agreement, uh, so there was a Palestinian airline that was flying from an Egyptian uh, uh, town called Al Harish. Um, so uh, and and so there was a crossing. The Rafah crossing was still open. If you can, if you get a visa to to Egypt, you can uh, get that accomplished. It takes a while. So we took a bus. We went to the Rafah crossing. It took a few hours. They they took us by bus. So. This is a special bus for all passengers who are leaving on that flight. So this is not open to, to anyone. Only passengers who are just transiting through Egypt can go, can make that trip. We arrived, we took this uh, airplane. Uh, it was a Dutch Fokker 50 or 55, I remember. It was a nice trip. And that trip was on the day that uh, Lady Diana was, ki was killed. So I remember it uh, very well. Anyway, I was able to make that trip to Jordan, and from Jordan, I, uh, I was able to get home. Of course, besides the, the two months that I wasted, uh, I had to buy another ticket. There were a lot of financial consequences to this. Um, I got pretty um, upset, and there was a class at Rice called Palestinian Nation Building. I don't know, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll cut it. Okay, so I'll I'll, uh, I'll end this uh, shortly, and then I'll talk about the siege. <laughs> this is all about the siege, by the way, and the fact that it has been ongoing for many, many, many years. The story that I described happened in '97, 13 years ago. In in '98, I went with a group of students from Rice. Uh, to go and see what things are like. It was about Palestinian nation building. People were hopeful that there is now the peace agreement, the Palestinian authorities in place, and hopefully there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Well, the very first thing that I realized and I noticed when I got there is that things have gotten actually worse. Instead of people uh, having uh, freedom of movement, freedom to work, seek employment, do the normal things that human beings like to do, uh, things were becoming more difficult. And I remember myself asking a question explicitly saying, oh, you know, this looks really bad. I anticipate that there is going to be another intifada. And of course, two years later, this is now history, and there was another intifada. Um, the Gaza situation, it's, you know, Hamas is an excuse. Hamas taking power is an excuse. Um, the only political thing that I'll say, I guess, is that Israel can blame itself for Hamas. I was there when Hamas did not exist. Um, I was there when people gave up on the United Nations. They gave up on Arab, Arab nationalism, for Arab governments. I was there when they gave up on the United States, the bastion of democracy and human rights. Um, I was there when um, this sense of despair was beginning to set in. They've tried everything, and maybe the only hope is the guy upstairs. And when you reach that point, then you become kind of ripe ground for anything uh, that might somehow bail you out of this situation. So Gaza has been systematically oppressed for many, many years. 
these closures have been ongoing for a long time. The real problem with Gaza is not the movement of, of material. Of course, that is critical uh, if you can't eat. You know, that's, that's, that's uh, very bad. But it's much more, it's m much more worse than that. Uh, the, the private sector in Gaza has been destroyed. There's no import-export, so there's no business. There's no, there are no livelihoods. There's no, no, no work to do. So families, and you know, you guys probably know all the statistics, the unemployment rate is over 50%. The malnutrition rate for uh, children is very high. Um, just by giving people flour and cooking oil and things like that, you're not solving the problem. The problem is that these are human beings who need to be able to work for a living, provide for their families. Um, they don't want to be spoon-fed. They don't want charity. They have dignity as human beings. Um, so these latest changes that are going on right now um, are not going to make a difference. So, okay, well, they can have tea. The problem is they, they can't afford to buy the tea. So what's the point of giving them tea? What's the point of g allowing pasta in? Some people can afford pasta, but there are ma the majority cannot afford to buy the pasta because they have no income. Going back to the mid-80s, that border crossing that I was telling you about, that's no man's land, <clears throat> used to be packed with uh, trucks and taxis that were driving laborers, Palestinian laborers, from their jobs in Israel. It used to have to spend uh, hours basically waiting in queue to get into Gaza. Um, of course, they decided to, to stop that, uh, that business of using the Gazans for labor in Israel. Um, there is no security threat if you've been through that crossing. Uh, you know that you can't smuggle weapons through the areas crossing. Um, so the security excuse is just that, an excuse. It, it really doesn't solve anything. It oppresses the people. But, but unfortunately, I think that that's really the goal. The goal is to oppress the people and force them to leave. No one wants to suffer like this. Um, and by the way, the people who could afford to leave have left. There are now, uh, there are still one and a half million people living in Gaza. Gaza's population is mostly built, made out of refugees. The b majority of folks there are people who came to Gaza after the 1948 war. Most of them live in squalid conditions in refugee camps. That's the fundamental problem. Fundamental problem is that there are human beings who want to live want to be able to live with dignity and work and afford a decent livelihood for themselves, for their kids. They want to be able to send their kids to college. Uh, they want to have water. They want to have electricity. Um, they don't want to be beggars dependent on foreign uh, aid. Um, David, you are a hero. I No, literally, you are a hero. Because, because um, a lot of times uh, we feel like no one cares. No one cares. Um, so it's people like you who give us hope. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you've done and what, what, what you continue to do. Uh, is my time up? Okay. Okay. I'm more than happy to answer more questions. There's a lot to say. Before we start the question and answer, I'm going to hand some uh, baskets around. We're uh, getting, we would like to get donations for the uh, Episcopal Hospital in Gaza. It's the um, Ali Hospital in Gaza. And uh, we get it to the Diocese of Jerusalem and they can get, they can get the money to the hospital. And uh, it wasn't me, but somebody tonight has already started off with a $50 contribution. 
And while that, the baskets are going around, um, we'd like to limit the questions. Uh, we don't want any speeches. We just want uh, one minute questions and be very respectful all around. Okay? All right, uh, first question in the back. Thank you. Uh, I was in Ramallah in, in uh, 2005. I had a conversation that went something like this. The Israeli government is making it very, very easy to uh, allow Palestinians, Christians, to leave. In fact, promoting that. I sort of heard that right now as well. That, that it's, it's sort of ethnic cleansing is a primary is a primary goal. That's what I think I heard. I know I heard it when I was in Ramallah. I think I heard that. And if it's not ethnic cleansing, secondarily, it's to it's to uh, what what's the word uh, uh, oppress oppress uh, 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 deny. Uh, expression of, of uh, political awareness. Uh, would you like to expand? Would you like to? I want to know about the cleansing part. Excuse me. You want to know about the what? I want to know if that's accurate from all of you. If you feel that if if that is a if that is a paramount policy of the Israeli government, so that they can then have the land for themselves. Azam, you want to start off addressing uh, uh, that? And then come down. I'll, I'll start. First of all, it is true that there's a significant uh, departure of Christians from the Holy Land. Um, I don't think it's the Israeli government that's actively doing so, but it's oppressing the people and badly enough that they, if, if they find have means or if they find uh, kind of an exit that would improve their lives, they do so. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, the fundamental thing, of course, is I think there is, of course, ethnic cleansing. That's what happened to the Palestinians in 1948. They were pushed or prevented from going to their homes. Why? Because their ancestors, if the, the religious point of view is their, their ancestors at some point be, believed in Jesus Christ. So your rights are determined by your religion. This is the Jewish state, so by definition it discriminates against non-Jews. So there's that apartheid religious discrimination part of the story, that's for sure. There's ethnic cleansing, and it's obvious there, that's documented how many Palestinian villages no longer exist. Um, but I don't know if, they, if, if the government... Yeah, I don't know if right now the government is actually going to people's houses and telling them you should leave. I don't think they do that, but yeah. it's a consequence of the oppression. Yeah, if I could just add to that. Um, I spent about a month in the occupied territories um, last year. And uh, by the way, if anybody wants to read the best single account, in my opinion, and I wrote a review of a number of recent books on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict recently, Sari Makdisi's book called Palestine Inside Out is absolutely fantastic. I read it before I went there. I went there. And I said, I've already, I already understand this, because I read Sari McDesey's book. He was uh, the late Edward Said's nephew. Um, anyway, he makes this argument in his book. I'll just repeat it very briefly. And this is exactly what I saw there. The main thing that Israel is doing in the occupied territories today is essentially they're trying to disappear Palestinians. They're trying to, they're trying to enclose them into small enclaves surrounded by wall, fence, network, road networks that bisect and cross, Israeli checkpoints within, building Israeli road infrastructure networks over, okay? That's, the, that's what the project is all about. It's essentially to build Israel on top of Palestinian lives and hide them as much as possible. Now, the problem is, is there's a lot of Palestinian lives on the land between Israeli settlements and, you know, the land that, uh, the rest of the land that, that Israel wants, or at least the right wing of Israel that's pushing this project, the Greater Israel Project. And so in that sense, what they've done is over the past eight years, and Sari Makdisi goes over this in great detail, what they've done is they control the population registry. Who's a Palestinian, who's not? Who can stay in the land and who cannot? And especially they're doing this in Jerusalem. 
basically a Palestinian release for any small amount of time. So it sounds like you know some of this stuff. In other words, so there's an increasing series of policies Israel's implementing that do not apply to Israeli Jews at all. Israeli Jew, go right to the occupied territories, no problem. Palestinian, do you have the appropriate um, ID? Do you have this? Do you have that? Have you lived here for three years or not? What's your private place? What's your place of dwelling, etc.? If you don't qualify, you're out. They ship you out. That's ethnic cleansing. Okay, that is increasing right now. All right, because it's applied indiscriminate. It's applied applied discriminate, discriminatorily, that's ethnic cleansing, right? Where one group of people have a different set of rules and they are forced to leave, and another people, same circumstances, are not forced to leave. No, but it's not the, I, I would only say it's not the primary goal of the project, okay? The way it looks right now to me, it's not the primary goal, but it's, it's becoming an increasing aspect of it. So. Anybody else wanna comment on that? Okay, yes. Yes, I have, I have two basic questions. The first one is to Mr. David. It's, around, it's about the massacre, uh, killing this nine people of the Marmara. Uh, I've heard, I've been watching the Al Jazeera channel, which is the best channel for the of information. And also, uh, some footages in, from YouTube that shows that Israeli opened the fire from the uh, uh, from the The question is whether the helicopters fired on the Precisely, alarm. before, even more, before. Before, before any encounter between the, uh, the um, <coughs> terrorist okay. organization and the Israeli soldiers. Well, I was not on board the, uh, the Turkish boat. I, as I say, I, I had sh switched over to a smaller boat, and we went very close to them, and within 50 yards when the attack had started. Uh, I cannot speak, you know, to that. I, I, I've heard it both ways, but I, in talking to people who were on board, uh, there does not seem to be, a, a, you know, a general opinion that they that firing had started. Live firing had started. When we went by, there was there was definitely a lot of firing going on. But whether those were paintballs, uh, the grenades were going off, paintballs were, were being fired, uh, whether live ammunition was being used at that time, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it might have been, as, as was suggested before, the, uh, the Israelis just blew it. They went out of, you know, they overreacted and, and you wind up with a tragic situation. Whether they had instructions to do this or not, I don't know. Um, it may be uh, that it was decided as a matter of policy to deter future fl flotillas, to say, hey, we're not just playing around, we'll kill you if we have to. Uh, and, and not being terribly reluctant about it. So I, I, I think this has been since my first uh, two years ago, uh, when I got, I went three times and then the next trip, the boat was rammed and almost sunk. Then the next trip, um, you know, there's an incremental progression here. Uh, and I think that, that those deaths, they may have been a, a matter of hysteria, but they may have also been a matter of policy. I cannot say one way or the other. But I, I, I suspect that the policy is certainly within the realm of possibility. Yes, sure, yes, sure, please, just one more question about the Gaza ghetto. Because that's, that's what this is in the reality. Uh, what happened to this uh, twelve thousand uh, Gaza ghetto that was destroyed in the humanitarian aid, all the medications, the food, uh, building materials, everything that is basic, basic, I'm talking about basic that people in Gaza need because they are in horrible situation right now. There was this, um, there was supposed to be, were supposed to form a kind of international organization that was supposed to supervise the delivery of those goods that have been acquired by the Israel. Do you, do you have uh, anyone uh, of you who can explain to me what happened to those goods and, and money and including well, a lot of the, the, the NGOs are, are uh, you know, I think are very conscientious. Uh, the the uh, ISM, the International Solidarity Movement, has been very active there. 
and what has happened to, for example, the, the material that was brought in on the boats that were supposedly going to be distributed after being inspected, whether the cement is now uh, turned into hand grenades, or, uh, you know, the, the, the reasons, the rationale for uh, not allowing this, this uh, material in is just so, uh, so nebulous and just so empty. I, I think it's, it's going to be a, uh, a very empty gesture, unfortunately, uh, the, the material that's allowed in. And it isn't just the, the material that's allowed in, but, but as long as you deny them access as a seaport, because it is the, it's, you know, we, we, were, the, we were not, uh, the Free Gaza Movement wasn't just concerned with bringing material in, but we wanted to open the, the sea lanes as, a, as guaranteed by the Oslo Agreement. And I think until that happens, uh, you're gonna have, you know, absolute control by the Israelis. And the Israelis, of course, say, well, they were trying to smuggle guns in. Well, that did happen a couple of times. They, they caught people uh, uh, trying to bring some munitions in, but they use these, these rare examples uh, as, a, uh, as an excuse and to justify uh, the blockade. So. Okay. We have another uh, question here. Yes. the settlement in the East Jerusalem part. What does Israel has in, in mind about Jerusalem? Why is it is, is sort of, to me, is an ethnic cleansing? And what are they trying to achieve? And what is the heaven goal in mind about East Jerusalem? Anyone would you? Please, thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah, if I could just, I've been doing some research on this, actually. So, um, so there's the issue of Jerusalem. Here's what's in the news right now, is that in the past few days, the, um, Head of the municipality, the mayor Barakat in uh, Jerusalem, has announced that um, I think I believe 20 to 30 Palestinian homes will be destroyed in the area, the the town, the Palestinian town of Silwan, right? And this has been ongoing. Actually, there are threats to demolish far more than that. Okay, this was a, a apparently a kind gesture, that sort of paradoxical kind gesture that only 22 to 30 will be destroyed, and not the others yet, and. Um, and actually, you see, uh, there's a lot of um, anger about this amongst Israelis, which is very interesting. But here's what's going on in Jerusalem. Um, since 1967, over the past 20, 25, 30 years, Israel's very consciously and deliberately tried to incorporate East Jerusalem, an extended definition of East Jerusalem, into Israel. This is the project. Incorporate, build roads through, around, over Palestinian areas, make it appear seamless, right? And they did this from the outside in by building large settlements all around and then dotting settlements in between. And it's always strategic. It's always the same. If you look at a map of Israeli settlements in the occupied territories, it's always the same. It's what Sharon always talked about. Take the hilltops, divide, set up, right? Make sure Palestinians have no contiguity, that they can't create contiguity, they can't have a state. Sharon thought about this in 1977. Anyway, just to get to this now, this is the final phase, which is basically now Israel is going after the Holy Basin, the areas closest to the walled off old city, all right? And they're doing this in a very interesting way, which is through private agents, right? They're allowing private agents to do this because then they can say, oh, we're not doing this, it's not government policy. And so this is what you're seeing in Sheikh Jarrah, which is very interesting because uh, a large number of Israeli students and professors at Hebrew University very courageously are now going down there and marching every day, right? Preventing the expulsion of Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah. And then let's get, there's three other places, but just interest of time, let's get to Silwan. The way that's being done is this um, right-wing former military intelligence officer, whatever that is, um, basically decided that he was gonna search for King David's remains and that he would find the city of David. And he basically used his military muscle and intelligence connections to get support to build this archeological museum. That's what they're doing. They're claiming that this is where the city of David is and this is the new strategy, theme park colonialism. And, and if you read the Israeli archeologists, which I find really interesting and other Archaeologists, there's no evidence for, I mean, I'm sorry, respect the Bible, it's an important book, but there's no evidence, okay? There's no evidence of that period in time, and there's no evidence there at this archaeological theme park. And what they're doing is they're using the park 
to wedge that area, and they're starting to destroy Palestinian houses. They're sprinkling the whole area with the Israeli settlers, and they're digging below them, searching for artifacts which are starting to cause Israeli houses, I mean, Palestinian houses to collapse. That's what's going on. If people care about peace, you have to care about Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is going to have to be shared. It has to be shared in any kind of solution in the future. And what Israel is doing right now, again, through these very right-wing organizations, um, the big no bingo magnet, Moskovitz, is actually funding this archaeological theme park. You can see a big plaque yes. for him there. Um, they are basically causing, making it impossible to make peace. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. And these people are the real anti-Israelis, as far as I'm concerned. So, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. I've been to Gaza uh, several three times. I've been to Dr. Yannis Baraj and Rafa. I also lived in Israel for five years. And I'd like to help people here understand how it is that Israel could be doing a siege of the kind that they are doing on one and a half million people in Gaza. My answer is, I've been to Iraq nine times. I just read in the newspaper in the New York Times in Boston, where I've been, 120 degree temperature, the people there have one hour of electricity. The reason they have one hour of electricity is because we bombed all the electrical plants in Iraq in 1991 in order to have, quote, long-term leverage to coerce the overthrow of Saddam by making life terrible for the Iraqi people. Now, 500,000 500, children in Iraq died, according to UNICEF. If you don't know that, if you don't know the one hour of electricity in Gaza in the recent, Israelis in Israel also don't know what's happening eight kilometers away in Bethlehem. <laughs> Please keep the, uh, anyone want to address it? Okay. Please try to, just one minute question. Uh, let's see, the way back. May I just say one thing? Yes, oh sure. Regarding the Jerusalem policy. Besides demolishing, encircling, you can't get a building permit if you're a Palestinian in East Jerusalem. You just, so there are multiple ways, and that's an important one, I think, that they don't give you a building permit. So people build houses without permits, guess what? They get demolished. Yes, in the way back, uh, our, oh. To me, it makes more sense that a one state solution to the answer. Because it's obviously impossible for Israel to coexist with Palestine. Uh, they have no intention of doing so, and I think they could be a binational state. And your question? So, my question is what do you guys think of a one state solution without Israel necessarily existing as a Jewish state, which I think is a racist concept? I'm Jewish, but I think it's a racist concept. Um, I am for a single state solution, ju just so that you know, I think, but it has to be a secular state. With one, one person, one vote, we all need to go to the army, not just the Jews among us. Uh, we all can work in defense industries and we just do, there's no discrimination, so absolutely. I guess I feel that, um, especially in my role as American and as someone who has lived in the region, works, cares deeply about it, but is not going to necessarily have to live there in any future situation, um, I prefer to dodge that question a bit. I, I prefer not to make it my, it's not my, it's not my um, issue, really. What my issue as an American and as someone who consistently stands up for human rights, for international law and things like that is, I believe regardless, one state, two state, it doesn't matter to me provided that human rights violations end, international laws upheld, and all rights are respected, okay? And so for me that means things like Israeli settlements on Palestinian land have to end. Israel's wall has to be taken down 
You can put it on their border, that's fine, but it cannot be eating and stealing Palestinian land. Israel's checkpoints have to be dismantled. Israel's control over water resources, the sky above, have to be stopped. Uh, colonization of Jerusalem has to end. And the rights of Palestinians inscribed in international law, which, including, which includes the rights of Palestinian refugees from 1948 to at least have the right to return, uh, have to be held. Out. I don't care how that turns out. If that's a one state, frankly, I think it's compatible with both a one state or a two state. Do you see what I'm saying? So I feel like that's my argument. That's my place to stand. And in some sense, I think one state, two state is a bit of a distraction sometimes uh, for us to fight for these issues, to educate on these issues, which to me are issues that Jews, Palestinians, Arabs, Muslim, every Christian, non-atheist, secular, we can all stand up for these issues. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so uh, I guess that's where I want to just stand on that one right now. If, if I could add, um, one of the things I admire about a group called Jewish Voice for Peace is that they don't take a position on this. Um, <clears throat> if you compare that to J Street, um, J Street is, um, sees itself as pro-Israel and, and pro-peace, um, but it's uh, trying to be, um, you know, good pro-Israel American Jews. Whereas JVP says, um, let, let's let the Palestinians and the Israelis work that out. You know, we, we, you know, we have uh, lots of opinions about it one way or the other, but it's really their future that they're dealing with. And if, if I could just get to another issue that um, takes us a little bit away from that. Um, we were talking about East Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, and places like that. I wanted to uh, raise the point of the support of American Jews for this project in East Jerusalem. There is a project uh, which we've been talking about, which I call a, a, Judaize, a Judaizing of East Jerusalem, where Irving Moskowitz and, and people like that come in and they, they, they either buy or steal a property here and there in an Arab community like Silwan or Sheikh Jarrah, and they, put, they plop down these uh, crazy sort of right-wing uh, pro-settler people, they put up the Israeli flag on the, on the building, and it becomes a new outpost in the heart of, of East Jerusalem. Um, what I want to say about that is that we, as American citizens, are funding this. And the way we're funding it is that Moskowitz uh, has these uh, entities in Israel, and a lot of his money is going to fund things that Steve was talking about, and it's, it's tax-deductible donations. So we have a lot of people in the American Jewish community that are contributing tens of millions of dollars every year that are going to buy or, or, or steal you know, these properties, and it's tax deductible. And our government, this is another criticism that I have of the Obama administration, does not have the guts to say to American Jews, if you want to do things like this that contravene American policy, because our policy is not to support settlements, um, it's, it seems like a quaint notion, but it's, that's been our policy, then why allow American Jews to get a tax deduction for that? And why are we subsidizing this uh, stuff that goes against what our own stated policy is? Okay. I'd like to just uh, offer a quick addendum to that uh, in terms of the uh, IRS uh, regulations. Only Israel and Canada uh, can uh, can uh, offer deductions for uh, for contributions. No other country in the in the world can, unless it is controlled by American uh, officers or what have you. So that's that's that. Just uh, going back to the the one state two state. Uh, I traveled back on on one of the trips uh, with Mustafa Barghouti, who is there are three Barghoutis around. One is in jail. One is uh, Omar is uh, he's represents another section. Uh, Mustafa is, is uh, a very moderate kind of a guy, and he was, uh, I, I asked him on this tr trip, I mean, we were face to face for at least three hours with Mered McGuire, and the three of us were having this, this conversation. And I asked him about his, his feeling about the one, one state versus two state, and he wouldn't commit himself. He said that he felt that there was so much division uh, between Hamas and Fatah that if you made that issue, uh, a, uh, a paramount of importance that it would just be to the advantage of the Israelis to uh, come up with a, another device that will, will keep the Israelis apart from, from a unified front. 
and that was his priority. When we uh, we had uh, been in uh, uh, in a in a Christian church in Gaza, uh, was hosted by a 75-year-old uh, uh, priest, and there were representatives from Fatah, from uh, Hamas, from Barghouti's own party, uh, and from a smaller uh, splinter group that I, I I can't recall the name, but all four of them had representatives under one roof, uh, and they each got up and they said, we are shamed into, into sitting here uh, with Fatah, sitting with uh, Hamas and so on. We are shamed by you people who, who, who stuck your necks out to come and to, to, to demonstrate to the world that uh, the problems we have here. And so the, we, we are shamed into putting our differences <coughs> aside, Hamas and, and, and Fatah. And they, they fashioned a, uh, an agreement uh, that they would exchange prisoners one from another uh, with each other. Barghouti uh, was going back and he was going to Cairo as soon as we, we landed. And I asked him, I said, do you think this, this harmony will, will survive the light of day? And he said he didn't know. All he could do is hope. Uh, and it turned out it was a failure because uh, uh, Hamas gave up prisoners and, and Fatah did not uh, match that, that uh, part of the agreement. But his, he stayed away from the one state, two state because he felt it was just one more issue that can keep uh, Gazans away from one another. And that's, that was the prime concern that he had. They must unify before they can have any kind of a solution. Before I get to the next question, I want to thank thanks everybody for being generous. We raised uh, $1,269.40 for the hospital in Gaza. Yeah. So your question? I'll get it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course. <laughs> yeah. Your your her question is she's an example of what we were just talking about. Well, your question earlier about ethnic cleansing. She's an example of someone who I don't know the exact details, but is a Jerusalem resident, probably has family that goes back generations, generations, etc. And yet, through a recently and it issued Israeli law that, that came up with some arbitrary number that if you don't live in this area for now for the past six years retroactively applied, you can no longer be a resident, your ID will be removed. I'm not sure your case, but it's probably like that. This is what's been going on. She no longer has any right to be where she grew up, where her family lives. And in, and in this case, someone coming outside who takes Israeli citizenship can come in, can stay, can leave for 10, you know, None of these rules apply to them, and that's what we're talking about. So, so you're, you've been illegally stripped of a right of residence, and so there's a whole campaign going on. A lot of great Israeli activists are working on this one, family reunification and ending the stripping of ID cards for Jerusalem residents. So, of course, <laughs> I mean, that would have to be part of sharing Jerusalem, right? Would be righting the wrongs of Israel's colonization and its practices in Jerusalem. So, but, but. It was a gentleman back there with the leather coat on. Yes. May I say something? Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Um, this policy is not new. I almost got stripped of my Gaza permit a long time ago. I can share the details with you offline. But this is a long-running policy. It applies to West Bank citizens, Gaza citizens, and now, of course, Jerusalem is extra it's special. Now. It's, it's it, yep, I agree. Can I, can I uh, just tell a, a horrific story? Um, there was an incident in East Jerusalem uh, where um, a Palestinian driver uh, was uh, driving down the street, and uh, no one knows exactly what happened, but he, it, he ended up clipping uh, some Israeli border police uh, with his car. He, I don't know, he injured one of them. And um, not very smart, he drove off. Now, there have been some incidents uh, in East Jerusalem where 
uh, Palestinians have taken various vehicles and used them to, um, you know, mow down people, and, and those incidents were, were terrorist in nature. This was not that kind of a situation. He was shot at as he fled. Um, he was cornered in the alley where his uncle lived, and he was wounded, and then an Israeli uh, border policeman uh, executed him at point blank range. Um, his, he has family in, uh, in the United States, in San Diego, and I've been in touch with his brother. Um, his brother was born and raised in, in Jerusalem and wa had you know, identity documents. When he tried to go back, they took it away from him. So it's the same kind of case, but here you have a situation where um, he's had this horrible tragedy happen to him and he doesn't have any uh, rights to, uh, you know, to, to, to go back and be um, you know, a Jerusalem resident, as his family has been. Okay, I'll just take two more questions. With a gray shirt on, uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in terms of health, here's what I know, and I can get you a lot more information because uh, my dad and my brother are, uh, are physicians. Um, spare parts for equipment do not, are not allowed to enter, so things that, go, that fail remain in that state for long periods of time. Uh, dentists run out of acrylic filling material, so you know, if you have a filling, it's hard to get it fixed right. Um, power is an issue, of course. Uh, most of the instruments require power. Power is not, a, uh, is not uh, reliable in Gaza. Let's state it that way. Um, uh, fuel to, to power the generators is also hard to find sometimes. Uh, they, they, believe it or not, they smuggle fuel through the tunnels across the Egypt uh, borders. Uh, this fuel often comes contaminated with sand and all sorts of stuff. Uh, the sand clogs the, the fuel filters in these generators. They start failing. There are no fuel, fuel filters, so they have to dismantle the fuel filters, empty them from the sand, kind of uh, jerry-rig. Uh, you know, there's one thing about Palestinians is that they're tenacious and they're persistent. I guarantee you we're not moving. If they, they, uh, they, they've been trying for many, many years. Many of us have left. It's the biggest guilt that I have, is being here and not there. Um, but they can't move three and a half, four million people. There are five more million, about four point some million of them are registered refugees who are waiting to go home. They can get rid of us. So the demographic problem, I think, is going to force this uh, to get resolved at some point. Okay, now the fellow with the leather jacket on, yes. Yeah, it's a question about the, uh, the economic situation in Israel. Because um, obviously we know here how the world financial crisis has changed this country and Europe and a lot of the world as regards to unemployment and housing and declining wages. So just how is this world financial crisis playing out inside the Israeli economy and amongst the social classes and the various immigrant layers inside Israel. Like, for example, has a strengthening of the Gaza border, does it mean that other immigrant layers are being found to replace them, or is it just a contraction of the Israeli economy? So just, we took in Israelis and Israeli, but you know, in a time like this, I'm going to make a lot of changes amongst the different groupings. Uh, I just think, uh, I would say as a layperson, I've just seen an article recently on this issue where Israel is doing better than almost any country in the world in terms of the economy. Yeah, um, Israel hasn't really been punished by the, uh, the world economic crisis. Um, Israel is doing very well, um, relatively, um, um, in that sense. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, in terms of labor, Israel has found a replacement for the Palestinians who used to uh, uh, be imported into Israel. Um, it takes cheap labor from all over the world, from Thailand, uh, countries like that, imports them, and um, treats them similarly to the way I hear they're treated in uh, Dubai and Qatar. You know, they're people who have minimal rights. Um, they can be abused, they, uh, both physically and, and in terms of you know, their wages. Their employers in Israel can take advantage of them. Um, and uh, Israel, you know, it's, it's unlike here, um, where at least um, Hispanic families who come here, if their children are born here, they become citizens. I, I don't, that's not the case in Israel. So um, it's, it's just a very, very bad situation. I should say, though, about Israel that there is a huge amount of poverty in Israel. And those who are the most economically disadvantaged are Israeli Palestinians and um, the group called Haredim, the, um, the ultra-Orthodox. Um, the secular Israelis tend to be uh, more well-to-do, and, um, and there is a huge gap, um, uh, economic gap, between the haves and the have-nots in Israel, and Israel hasn't done very much um, to address that gap. Okay. One, one last question with the lady in the red. Um, so where do we go from here? We all get to go home tonight without our passports in our pockets, without any checkpoints and go to bed and get up in the morning without thinking our power will be gone and our water will be there. So what are next steps for us? David mentioned that we should invite each year our presidents and our congressmen, but, but if we had an army. Yeah, why don't we each speaker address that? And then, 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 then we'll call it off and, and uh, encourage you to visit the tables and you can come up to the speakers. Thanks, Mom. Uh, <laughs> Keeping everybody around, that figures. <laughs> All right, my, my, quick, my quick take on this is that for those who are really interested in a just peace, that is rights for Palestinians, security for Israel, a future um, unlike the present, um, I think we have to have a long-term vision and a sense of strategy far beyond what Obama's gonna do in three months, far beyond the latest news of this or that event. And what we have to do is kind of what I was saying in, in my original talk was, there are cracks in the edifice of this really dysfunctional, counterproductive, wholesale embrace of the United States, I think United States and particularly the Israeli right wing, the, the Greater Israel Project, and we have to erode that. And it's already starting to erode. Israel is not a strategic asset for the United States. It's a backlash producer for the United States. We need to really hammer this message home. It's not in our interests to support Israel's occupation, but it's also not in our interest to support our own occupations. That's number one. We've got to change our foreign policy at, at the same time as changing Israel's policies. They, they go hand in hand. The second thing is, I think we should really support and encourage alternatives to the right wing, so-called pro-Israel establishment. I don't believe they're pro-Israel, and I think more and more people in the American Jewish community and in the Israeli Jewish community are understanding that these people do not represent them. We need to encourage those, not uncritically, but we need to encourage that, do you see what I'm saying? Encourage that split. These right-wing people have been dominating, saying they speak for American Jews. I, we need to support those who are, who are sending a message of peace and hope. And lastly, I think we need to, and this is kind of leading into your point, how you ended, I think we need to embrace this glowing, growing global movement, which is saying we are agents of change ourselves. We're not waiting for anybody else. We are going to use whatever we can to hold Israel accountable. And if that means divesting, if that means not buying certain products, whatever it takes. It's not gonna really hurt in the short term Israel financially, but what it does do is it changes the environment where maybe at some point negotiations that really do get at the issues we care about can actually take place. Right now, I don't see them happening. So we have to be agents of change. That's my line. Well, I agree with that. And as I, I said earlier, the, uh, uh, the BDS, as we both agree, is, is, is one small uh, step that we can all share in and, and uh, go down the list of things that uh, have their origin in Israel. And, and bit by bit, <clears throat> is going to have an take an economic toll, and that they will listen to it. It worked in South Africa, and there's no reason to think that uh, Israel uh, Israel is uh, immune from that same kind of a pressure. Uh, I, and I, I go back to urging you to, to write the letters and to join the, your 
your local groups here when they, when they demonstrate. Let the, let the world know, just, I mean, there's a, a wonderful turnout here, but uh, let, the, the, let the world who is not here uh, see supporters of the Palestinians in, in Westlake Village or wherever there is a public demonstration and uh, turn out and, and put a face to, you, to what you're actually thinking. Um, I think that the people in this room um, basically already have the, the message um, and, and are fairly well educated about the issue. I'd like to encourage you to um, talk to your family and your friends and uh, people you come into contact with and urge them to educate themselves. Tell them to read an article in the newspaper, to read a book, go see a movie, write a letter to a congressman. Um, we have a couple of good congressional representatives here like um, um, Jim uh, McDermott. Um, but but uh, that doesn't mean that they're all as good, so uh, find out who is in your district, write a letter, try to have a meeting. Um, when issues like the Gaza siege come up or the Goldstone Report, where our Congress is going to take a position, um, I think that they need to know uh, to hear about more than, uh, they need to hear from more than just uh, the, the local APAC representative or, or someone from the Israel lobby who has their ear. Um, they need to understand, as Steve said, that, um, that uh, APAC is not the only organization that um, speaks on behalf of American Jews or speaks on behalf of Israel. Um, support groups like uh, Jewish Voice for Peace um, and, and even J Street, although I have some, some questions and some issues with J Street. But um, um, you know, as, as he was saying, as Steve was saying, um, we need to encourage this change. We need to break down the, um, the stereotypes um, that have existed that, um, that force our congressional representatives to think that they have to be in lockstep uh, with Israel. I would just like to add one thing in, in terms of sources of information. Uh, I read uh, Aretz uh, at least three times a week, and Aretz is uh, Gideon Levy and Amara Haas are two of the best commentators on the conditions in Israel. They're the most critical. They're far better than anything you can find in the New York Times and most of our publications here. And I really, as a, as a, as a good source, you'll, you'll find the right represented and the left represented. But I, I think those two reporters are worth, worth looking for, um, you know, a, a couple of times a week because they, they really are excellent, excellent. Oh, yes, there are many, many other groups. No, no, there are, uh, I'm not just, but I'm saying a, ret, a lot of people don't uh, think of that as a source of information, and I, I've, I've been uh, very impressed by this. Um, there, there's not much to add, actually. I think uh, everything that's been suggested has been great. Um, I, I really like the idea of an economic boycott. I think it's an unviolent means that can actually get something accomplished. But when you decide to participate in that, you have to be willing to boycott Intel, to boycott IBM, to boycott those companies that also make money by perpetuating this discrimination. They don't hire Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem at these companies. So they're also helping the, with this uh, discrimination. Um, Continue sending aid, continue, uh, I just concur with everything you guys did. I don't know what else I can, what I can say. All I can say is, as a U.S. citizen of Palestinian descent, I know that the cheapest way for us to have security, to guarantee our strategic oil supply, um, and to save our people and our soldiers is to solve the Palestinian-Israeli problem. Okay, thank you. One, one last, uh, one last uh, speaker. Huda Gibbons, who I learned about Palestine and is talking Palestine, has an announcement. Yes, and uh, um, hold it for me because I don't have my. No, you hold it for me. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> I want to tell you that in this room there is pure Palestinian olive oil being sold. It's being sold by the Rachel Corey Foundation, which is right over there. It's also being sold by uh, Ziad Zaytoun for the Continental Pastry Shop. 
We want you all to go here in Seattle. It's on the Ave. So we want you all to go and support them because they are um, stocking this. And they're stocking it for us here in Seattle. But also you can get it from the Cory Foundation who are located in Olympia. So please do buy it. It's pure Palestinian olive oil from those olive trees that are still in the ground. Uh, I want everybody to uh, thank the speakers uh, tonight. It's been terrific. Mm. Mm -hmm.